get to know your librarian. Health science librarians have really expanded their roles mm -hmm. in an academic health center. Welcome back to the Faculty Factory Podcast. I'm Kim Skorupski. I'm the Associate Dean for Faculty Development at Johns Hopkins. And on today's episode, we have Dr. Wendy Ward from the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Dr. Ward is the Director of Interprofessional Faculty Development, the Associate Director of Professional Wellness, and she's a clinical psychologist and in pediatrics by training. Welcome back to the Faculty Factory, Wendy. Thank you. Happy to be here. Well, we are so excited about your 10 tips. Been getting lots of great feedback. People love it. Uh, you have a great, great way of conveying enthusiasm and excitement, but also very um, concise, thoughtful questions to guide us through various issues in our career. So I'm so excited. What do you have for us today? So I thought today we talk about 10 tips for busy clinicians looking to get published. Busy clinicians looking to get published. Okay, I like it. Let's go. So I work quite often with early career faculty who are very busy clinicians. Before they have leadership roles, they can be even up to and including 100% in the clinical environment. And we hope that they have some protected time to do the scholarly work required of promotion and or tenure, but that isn't always the case. But either way, Learning tip number one, to work smarter, not harder, can be really critical. I encourage people to write about what they're doing. Case studies or case series, uh, scoping or narrative literature reviews on a particular topic, and trying to get those things published in the venues that take that kind of work can sometimes be a good step for a clinician into the scholarly work uh, environment. Mm -hmm. uh, I do often have or, or maybe sometimes have um, people who push back on that and want to write about or do uh, research on something completely different. And I don't think that that's um, excluded. I think you can totally do that. But it does mean that you can't leverage some of your clinical time to be helping you with uh, your research time. For instance, if you're doing clinical work uh, and you're doing research uh, in that area, sometimes being able to obtain subjects they're right there and available for you. Sometimes being able to provide a questionnaire that they turn in at the end of the visit into a, a, a box with a slot on the top can make things a lot more simplified. Yeah. And so you have to balance where your innate interests are with your scholarly work, but also with some pragmatics of the amount of time you have available and how to work it into a busy day. Mm -hmm. Tip number two is to make sure someone hasn't written about it already. I know that yeah. sounds really simplistic, but Oops. I have been halfway through a project and then seen someone else publish on it uh -huh. and kind of go, oh, no, all that work is gone, yes. <laughs> which it really isn't gone. You can then read that article and skip down to the part where it says future research and see if there's any way you can meet the, that they're saying is the next step. And so even work that you feel might be duplicative, you can pivot just a touch and really add to that existing database. Mm -hmm. Number three, get to know your librarian. Health science librarians have really expanded their roles mm -hmm. in an academic health center. Okay. So the librarians that I've worked with across several different institutions don't just help you find an article, but they can help you with a systematic literature review. You would give them the parameters and they would do that search for you mm -hmm. to support uh, a systematic literature review paper. Mm -hmm. They're also really good partners as co-authors. They can be uh, very detail-oriented. They can help you find the right uh, journal offering or, you know, opportunities to the best fit for your article. They can help with references and organizing those. They can help with tables and other things. Being really well-versed in what the literature offers can also help you in the writing. So I'd encourage you to think about um, having a specialist help you with literature reviews and other writing activities. Mm -hmm. Number four is to get students involved. So I have spent a number of projects working with students that I was very passionate about and could have done myself. But you leverage the additional time a student has 
if you want to move something forward faster than having one, two, or even a small team of students help you or colleagues um, can really move something forward with everybody's little bit of time added together and organized well, can really move that project into publication or presentation mode um, much more quickly. You also can spend some of that time uh, with students and helping them build their research skills up particularly their clinical research skills. And advising, advising a student on that project helps you in three ways. Not one, not two, but three. One, leveraging your time and theirs. Two, getting it done faster. And three, mentoring is an educational activity for your packet. Right. Uh, and then if you're super lucky, number four will be that ultimate publication. So mm -hmm. four ways that working with students can be really helpful. That's right. Number five. Everything you do, present it at a conference. Yes. Everything cool and interesting you do, from a really unique case study to your clinical experience over time to a particular research project, whatever it is, find an outlet, whether it's a state, a regional, national conference, wherever it is, and then everything that you present, commit to publishing it somewhere. That means for any given piece of work that you've engaged time and um, commit, committed to, you get two bangs for your buck, as it will, on your CV, at least one presentation and one publication, and sometimes more as a project develops. It might be um, different aspects presented in uh, at different um, uh, national presentations or um, leading to more than one publication effort, just as that project grows or you think about next steps. But I would say that everything you do, really try to present and to publish. Number six is getting trained in quality improvement. So a clinician's best friend is a QI project. Mm. Institute for Healthcare Innovation has free and low-cost online modules. Mm. Uh, those modules help build your QI knowledge and you can apply quality improvement, process improvement to your clinical area. So if you have patient satisfaction rates that are um, not where you'd like them to be and it's because of clinic flow, you can design a QI project, improve the clinic flow, track the outcomes. It makes your patients happier and they want to come back. So that's great for you as a clinician. But if you're doing it in a structured quality improvement way, using that methodology, you can also publish it. And many boards require a QI project. So this would count for that as well. Okay. And just so you know, and referencing the utilized students in your environment to help you, many residents can bank their QI projects while on residency or fellowship for their later board application. So if you need some helpers who might be motivated, their preparation for some big hurdle down the road, working with you, getting it out of the way, could be really motivating to them. Number seven, block time to write. So I, I do get pushback on this for those uh, in a point in their career where they're really 90, 95, 100% clinical, depending on how your institution approaches that world. And it's really hard to protect time to write. But I'm going to tell you, at one point, I was on a track similar to that and trying to even protect an hour or two hours or even a little bit of a weekend or one evening a week still allows you to have professional wellness, which I am also passionate about. Um, but it does give you some protected time so you can move forward. And I had a good friend who was a medical writer who gave a talk on being able to um, uh, write a paper in 10-minute increments or less. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll admit, I've never been able to get it down to 10 minutes, but I can do it in 30-minute increments. Mm -hmm. And so if you can block small amounts of time, you really can get that final product eventually. That's absolutely right. And I endorse that all the time in my WAGs, the writing accountability groups. You need less time than you think. So I totally am drunk that Kool-Aid with you, Wendy. <laughs> Great. Along that vein, I would also plan for double the amount you need because there's nothing worse than having a deadline looming and you've protected time, but something crisis oriented gets in the way. So you want to protect four to six o'clock on a Wednesday and your 3.30 patient comes in in crisis and um, you're dealing with that instead of your writing. So I always 
uh, pad the schedule just a little bit and make sure I've protected just about double what I actually need. And in the end, I've got kind of what I need <laughs> because other things get in the way. Perfect. Number eight is really learn how to use a reference manager. And I'll tell you, I did not learn this until way too late in my career. Mm -hmm. There's nothing worse than you've tried it at one journal and it's all formatted for that journal. And then you've just decided to try another, but oops, it's a different format. If you use a reference manager, it does take a while to enter in the references the first time, but it's one click to change it from AMA to APA or some other more esoteric specific kind of formatting guideline. Mm -hmm. And so a reference manager mm -hmm. can be your best friend. And when I mentioned the librarians earlier, I mentioned reference managers. They're super good at getting those pulled in easily. And so they might be able to help you with that in preparation for your manuscript. Number nine is looking for journals that take reviews, case studies, clinical research that might be uh, not the most rigorous. So not uh, with... Um, uh, you know, randomized control trials or with um, comparison groups, but still move the knowledge forward, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, there are also certain journals that really look for quality improvement projects. So you want to have a list of who, what those journals are in your field and target those. There's nothing worse than having to resubmit and resubmit and resubmit because you're not making the best fit choice for your journal. And I actually found a really unique toil, tool recently called Jane. Oh, so Jane, mm -hmm. oh yeah, it, it's an online resource. What you do is, uh, or one way you can use it is you can cut and paste your abstract into Jane. And if you Google jane.org, you'll find it. It stands it in for there the and journal, it, journal Author Name Estimator, Jane, J-A-N-E. Yeah, you got it. When you go ahead, tell them. Exactly. So if you put your abstract in there, it will actually rate for you top choices uh, based on what your abstract is talking about, um, analyzing all of those words. What are the top choices of journals for you to submit to? It will also analyze whether the journals are rigorous in their scientific review or not, which will help you avoid a predatory or um, one that has a loose or non-existent peer review. You want to stay away from those if you're looking for a quality um, scientific outlet. So Jane can be super useful. It'll rank impact factor too. So, you know, you want to try and get your work into a higher ranked journal. Um, so impact factor of a higher number could be helpful, but you also don't want to shoot the mark, right? You don't want to go so high that it's going to be such a rigorous review that it's going to be harder for clinical research to um, meet the requirements to get in. Mm -hmm. And looking at the author guidelines for each journal can help you with that particular piece. And then number nine, my last tip for how busy clinicians can get published, ask a mentor to review as an editor before submitting. Mentors are there to give you feedback on a wide range of things. And you may have mentors that are useful in different areas of your career. If you have one that has a, a background in clinical research who really understands how to write that and what journals are looking for, have them read through it and give you some structured advice that can be super helpful. Now, and I also looked up while you were talking the IHI.org because free modules, we love it. The IHI, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, you are right exactly on with that one. So friends, check that, that site out because anything free modules about quality improvement, wonderful. You and I'll are, tell you many instances well, have a program to teach QI and they use, frequently use a Lean Six Sigma curriculum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you can do a QI project while you're learning, and then you would get a what's called a green belt, which is testament to your quality in QI. It's good for promotion to have a green belt, but it's also a good set of skills in QI that you can utilize over and over as you're doing your clinical research. Oh, my gosh. I'd never heard of that. That is amazing. What a great resource. And then also then don't forget Jane. That's another great, great resource. Wendy, you are amazing. Um, such always so chock full of great tips and gems and nuggets for all of us. Thank you so much for sharing these with us today. You're welcome. All right, friends, you've been listening to Dr. Wendy Ward. I hope she got you encouraged and inspired like she did me. And if you're a busy clinician, oh my gosh, uh, she's given you lots to think about to help you get published. Dr. Wendy Ward is at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. 
aren't they lucky to have her in Little Rock? Till the next (laughs) time, friends. Talk to you later. Bye, Wendy. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.